New presidential poll sending the entire crew at MSNBC into a hot, sweaty panic, and it's a delightful thing to watch. Actually, CNN is panicking, too. All the right people are upset about these polls, and we'll give you all the details and, even better, their reactions. Plus, Rashida Tlaib throwing down with the pro-Hamas people and running away from Fox News. It's like she's going to set herself on fire there on the couch. Oh, I shouldn't give her any ideas. Oh, and Donald Trump went to Chick-fil-A. And what happened there could very well tell you exactly how this presidential election is going to go. We got all that and a whole lot more because it's Thursday. I'm Larry O'Connor, and you need to call me Larry. Streaming live right now on Rumble. Thanks for joining us. Boy, the comments were flying yesterday. I wasn't able to interact. We had a very busy, lots of moving parts kind of show yesterday. But it was great to see all the comments and all the interaction at Rumble. If you're uh, with us live, please contribute to the conversation. And if you're watching us after the fact, either on Rumble or YouTube or wherever you're watching these clips, thank you for your support. Just give us a like. It doesn't cost you anything. Maybe a subscri subscription if you're not already subscribed. Uh, notifications would be a big deal as well for us. Uh, and share the links whenever you have a chance. Check us out on all of our sites at Town Hall Media. Townhall.com, hotair.com, PJ Media. Dot com, redstate.com, all your favorite sites, Twitchy, and also Bearing Arms. All right. In the uh, Atlanta area, Donald Trump made a campaign appearance at a local Chick-fil-A. This is just sort of one of those things that candidates do, right? We see Joe Biden try to do this all the time. It's always awkward. It's always weird. It's always uncomfortable. He never knows where he's supposed to walk. He never knows what he's supposed to say. He always has a card in front of him that reminds him of what his name is and what country he's living in. And inevitably, when he just sort of wanders off on his own, he ends up like smelling some woman's baby and sticking his nose in her ear or something. It's always weird. But with Trump, somehow magic happens. <laughs> That was wow. worth it. And I love those, what you have here. Let me see. That's beautiful. Wow. It's art, right? It's art. So can I have 30 milkshakes? And also some chicken. I'm going to take care of the customers. This is good. Making a lot of money. Everyone can get rich, right? Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. So you're going to see more. We got a lot from this visit. But uh, first, just in terms of the optics and the incredibly friendly, happy and what appears to be kind of an excited staff. If you noticed, entirely African-American, almost entirely female. And what's this? The, I, I want to be able to have the moxie to walk into a Chick-fil-A and put an order like that. in. we'll take 30 milkshakes and some chicken. Who orders a Chick-fil-A like that? Uh, but then he finished up in perfect Trumpian fashion and exactly how you would expect a president to communicate with people who are working at a fast food chain, right? Which is, again, the polar opposite of what Joe Biden or really any Democrat would do. All he asked was, you guys happy? Business good? Making a lot of money? Getting rich? Because this is America. Joe Biden walks in there and he says, tell me how you've been oppressed. Tell me, tell me how you need me to relieve your student loan debt, right? Trump, complete opposite. This is the land of opportunity. America is the greatest place. You're at a Chick-fil-A right now. You could own this place someday. And that's the messaging you want from a guy who wants to be president, who has been president. Well, look at the way you hold. You like each other, right? <laughs> I, I think that's very nice. Have a good time. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. So we'll order 30 milkshakes. We'll give them out to the people and we'll take some for ourselves. Okay? Good. Thank you very much, everybody. Hello. This has got a great, great American franchise to play. It is. It's a great franchise. The owner is a great man who is a member of one of my clubs and he's fantastic. And uh, yeah, they do very well. They're closed on Sunday. The Lord's Chicken. That's the Lord's Chicken. You're right. It's good chicken, too. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Get ready for a milkshake. You got plenty of All right. Oh, 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 this is an original from 2016. Oh, I love this guy. 
I like that guy. Do you have a pen for me? Give me a good pen. That's your, that is the original, huh? Now he's going to sign this MAGA hat. And the guy says it's an original from 2016. As you see him turn the corner here, and again, listen, this is a politically staged event. We're used to that. But what's going on inside the restaurant isn't staged, right? Those were just people who were enjoying the Chick-fil-A. And then the Secret Service comes, hey, just so you know, Trump's coming in here. He's going to do a thing. We got cameras. Uh, and then and then we'll be done. Well, the restaurant is full of pretty much predominantly black customers in this Atlanta, Georgia Chick-fil-A. And now this natural, spontaneous interaction with just a bunch of everyday folks from Atlanta uh, who are just enjoying a fast food lunch. This is what a politician can do when they actually have that that retail shaking hands, kissing babies kind of magic. Again, not like Biden, where it's always awkward and gross and creepy. This is what you can't teach a politician how to do. And this, just like in 2016, is Trump capturing that magic again. I got to tell you, there's something different about Trump running again as a challenger, as opposed to Trump in 2020 running as an incumbent president and also, by the way, because of the pandemic, he wasn't able to do this kind of thing, right? It was all very staged and very programmed and socially distanced. He did rallies, but that was about it. And that might also be a major difference maker this time around in this campaign, because he's able to be Trump at his best. Good Trump doing what he does best. 2016, Cleveland. Uh, you've been there from the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You knew what was happening. Absolutely. You got it. <laughs> That's cool, man. What's your name? Lawrence. Okay, Lawrence, let me get this pen out of here. Come here. It's a pleasure. He understood long before the rest, right? This is from Shelly Winter. I talked to you yesterday. Oh, good. You are fantastic. Thank you, bro. You know Shelly? Yes. A great host. All right. So you're getting the C-SPAN camera, which is like right in the entrance and following him. You can't see what the perspective looks like from inside the restaurant. But of course, everyone there has their smartphone. Everyone inside the restaurant is taking video. So let's see what the scene looks like from that angle. And it's going to blow you away. Nice to see you, everybody. How you doing, Trump? I'm doing good. I love you, man. Everybody have a good time. Get ready. Yeah, I'll give you one. I, can I just read at the beginning? My favorite part of this is just some guy who's like, you know, in the back of the restaurant eating his Chick fil A. He goes, Hey, that's Trump. And he walks up and he goes, He gets to the front. He goes, How you doing, Trump? <laughs> what else do you say? Nice to see everybody. Here. How you doing, Trump? I'm doing good. I love you, man. How you doing, Trump? I'm doing good. The then a moment happened that I should, it did go viral and it should dominate political conversations for the rest of this year. There is a moment that is so unscripted, so unplanned, so spontaneous, and so priceless that this woman might get a cabinet position. Take a look. I don't care what the media tells you, Mr. Trump. We support you. We support you, Mike. Okay, 4 p.m. Come here, let me give you a So she starts by saying, I don't care what the media says about you. We support you, Mr. Trump. And his response, well, I mean, that's just, that's magic. That's political magic. And I mean, listen, as much as I like Ron DeSantis and other Republicans who are running for president, DeSantis can't do that. He doesn't do that. There's something weird there. Uh, but Biden can't do it. If Biden said, come give me your hug, he'd make it weird and creepy. But this is this is Grandpa Trump. Seeing this young black woman saying, by the way, look at the faces. Look at the faces of everybody in this Atlanta, Georgia, Chick-fil-A. And she says, I don't care what the media says about you. We support you, Mr. Trump. And it's just, I mean, here, I'll turn the audio off. Come here, let me give you a <laughs> Oh, 
This is amazing. I don't care how much money you raise in politics. What did what did Biden raise in Radio City Music Hall? Twenty five million dollars with Lizzo dancing on the stage and Obama and Clinton. Uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars. You can't buy that. That's priceless. You can't buy that. And this is Trump at his best, being good Trump on the campaign trail, at, at interacting with people, making people feel good about themselves, making people feel good about the possibilities in this country and where we might be able to go. And yes, I keep pointing out the fact that this is in urban Atlanta, Georgia, and it's nothing. Look at the smiling faces of the young black people at the Chick-fil-A. You know, oh, wait, why do you care about their race, Larry? Why do you care about their race? Why do I care about the race of the people here? Because right now, Joe Biden and the Democrats and their pawns in the media and in entertainment, they are planning the next summer of fiery but peaceful protests. They're planning the next George Floyd summer of riots and arson in our cities. Dividing this country helps Democrats. Making us hate each other helps Democrats. Dividing us in the most vitriolic and violent ways across racial lines helps Democrats. If black people are happy and encouraged and excited about Donald Trump as their potential president, Democrats are history. That's why while Donald Trump was doing this and getting this kind of reception at a Chick-fil-A in Atlanta, in front of a courtroom in Chicago, we had this woman. This woman is the mother of a young man named Dexter Reed who died because he started shooting at police officers from his vehicle after he had been pulled over by the cops. He started shooting. He hit a cop in her hand. Police opened fire, and he died as a result of the gunshot wounds. But yesterday, in front of a courtroom, the media and Democrats paraded this woman out as the grieving mother of a young man who was just shot in cold blood by the evil white racist cops in Chicago, and his only crime was driving while black. That's the narrative they want you to have. This is the black America that the Democrats and the media want to promote. Not the happy faces at a Chick-fil-A who were excited about seeing the guy who actually helped the economy, helped unemployment, and actually funded historically back black colleges permanently for the first time at the federal level. They don't want you to see that. They want you to see this. He had just bought his new car three days before that. And he was just riding around in his car. He said, Mom, I'm going for a ride. And they killed him. They killed him. And then she faints. Then she faints like a bad version of Aunt Esther on the old Sanford and Son show. And if you don't get that reference, look it up. You'll see exactly what I mean. This is the device of America that the left needs, that Joe Biden needs, demands. If people are happy, if people are hopeful, if people are excited about new energy, youthful energy in the person of Donald Trump, comparatively speaking, that's bad for them. I think it's terrible that Mr. Reed died as he did. I have some post-mortem advice for him or for anybody who is caught in the same situation. Probably, it's just me talking, you shouldn't open fire on police officers when you're pulled over. Just, uh, just, just you know, fatherly advice there. And then maybe things will go a different way. Don't shoot at cops. And then they tend to not shoot at you. Financial experts thought we were in the clear this year. In February, we we're supposed to have a interest rate reduction because inflation had finally stabilized, but then inflation went up and bye-bye interest rate reduction. They were hoping for six this year. They'll be lucky to have three. In fact, probably even worse because yesterday's inflation news just as bad, higher than expected. What is three and a half percent? We are in a tailspin right now in this economy. It's not going away. It's not going to change. It can't change until our politicians do something about it. This isn't free market economics. This is government intervention by printing money that we don't have to pay for things that we don't need and can't afford. We're now $34 trillion in debt. That's how you get this inflation. That's how you get interest rates through the roof. That's how an economy continues to stall. Now, you can bury your head in the sand, like a lot of people do, or you can actually do something about it.
diversify a portion of your savings in gold with Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge against inflation, always has been. Birch Gold makes it easy for you to own. They'll help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and you don't pay a penny out of pocket. They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, thousands of satisfied customers. You also can trust Birch Gold, too. Just text the word Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, text Larry to 989898, and you'll get a free info kit on gold. Then you'll talk to a precious metal specialist on how to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text Larry to 989898. Do it right now. So the polls are rolling in now, and it's not just national polls. It's not just state-by-state polls. We've got polls that break down by age group, by demographic, by sex, by ethnicity, whatever you want about how people are feeling with regard to policies, with regard to the economy, with regard to all of the things that matter most to you. And plus, focus groups are happening on a regular basis where they're asking voters, where do you stand right now? What's upsetting you? What are you hoping for in the election? And who are you going to vote for? And none of it is good news for Joe Biden or the Democrats, or for that matter, Mika Brzezinski and the good folks at MSNBC. Here she is expressing only can be described as rage at everyday Americans who don't agree with her about how great Biden is and how awful Trump is. I want to show two more. Um, The undecided voters were also asked how they think President Biden is doing on the economy. Take a listen. I think he's been absolutely disastrous for the economy. Mm -hmm. I agree. Six, raise your hand if you think President Trump's policies on the economy would be better for your family personally. Raise your hand. All right. So that is everybody. President Biden uh, argues that his economic record has been very good. Said President Trump's was not as good. Um, what 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 are you keying off of, uh, Sean? Since you had the best smile, I mean, we, Virginia, the second I, best smile. What are you keying off of to say President Trump's economic policies would be better? For I mean, the, my past performance of my of my four hundred one k. I know it was post twenty twenty, and everything kind of flipped around, but. You can't you can't blame everything on 2020 for forever. We have areas here in Pennsylvania where it's just at a standstill right now. Like things are supposed to be being built and the interest rates are just way too high for people to to to, you know, invest and and start moving, moving around. And and Virginia, just staying with you because because Pennsylvania is near and dear to Joe Biden's heart. Are, Are there Biden policies that you would blame for the problem? And if so, what are they? The interest rate is so high right now, and I know they're trying to um, cut the inflation down. But like if nobody is building, no no businesses are really coming to Pennsylvania right now to keep us moving forward. Even if you're trying to um, buy a house because I'm trying to become a first time home buyer, the prices are so high right now. It's just hard. Is there anything Joe Biden could do or say between now and, and, and the time you vote that would make you feel differently about feeling that his policies would not be as good for your family on the economy? Or have you, are you pretty much decided that Trump's policies would be better for the economy? I mean, I feel like he doesn't even take accountability for what's at all with what's going on in the economy. Not even accountability, like he's in denial that it's happening. The point is Biden needs to hear the people because when he's talking about the economy doing stellar, he's talking about the stock market. He's not looking at homelessness or joblessness. He's not at the point point thinking about how much it costs to go to the grocery store. And he's gaslighting literally everyone in the process. And and Omar, you voted for Joe Biden last time, right? Yeah, yeah. Some really important and hard insights for the Biden campaign to hear there. And hearing all that, you might think things are pretty bad for President Biden. That was not good. And, And she seems kind of angry about it. She actually went on in this segment to express her anger and frustration that the voters just aren't paying attention. That's what the White House message is right now. You heard that from Pete Buttigieg over the weekend, right? Well, you know, really the most untold. I'm trying to do his his smug Kermit the Frog voice. But if you want to sound like Pete Buttigieg, just try to do a Kermit the Frog, but be smug about it. You know, the big untold story in American politics is how robust the Biden economy is. He's not getting enough credit for how great things are. That's the only message they've got. Things are great. And if you don't feel it, that's your problem. Open up your eyes at how great things are. And the problem is people are opening up their eyes when they go to the grocery store or when they try to sell their house or even worse, when they try to buy a house 
and they get an interest rate that is four times higher than it was just three years ago before Joe Biden became president. It's an absolute disaster. And I know that that panel was supposedly called the undecideds, but it seems like they've decided. That's the other interesting thing about the polls that we see right now is that there's a still like between 7 and 12% of the electorate who claim that they're undecided. Really, at this point, since this is the exact same choice we had four years ago, you're undecided about which way to go between Trump and Biden? No, I think you've decided. You just don't want to say. And we know why you don't want to say. We see what happens to people who say they support Donald Trump. We get it. You don't have to say. Just keep it yourself. Keep your head down. Keep your eye on the prize, get to the election polling place next November and vote. That's all. Just vote. But because the economy is so bad, because the undecideds reacted that way and pissed off Mika Brzezinski, well, the Democrats and the media, they're going to do whatever they can to talk about everything except the economy, everything except the crime in the streets, everything except the border crisis and illegal immigration and how it's hurting us every which way. They want to talk about everything except national security and the fact that there's wars in the Middle East and wars in Europe and threats coming from China. They want to talk about everything except those things. So what are they going to do? They're going to divide us. They're going to divide us over abortion. They're going to divide us over race. But I don't think that's going to work either. Take a look at these undecided voters who supported Donald Trump, excuse me, who supported Joe Biden last time around. Black voters in Georgia, what are they thinking now? Then there's there's not really a, a discussion for me. When we met at this barbecue restaurant in Atlanta, all four told me they were raised and originally registered as Democrats. But this year, the president's handling of the Israel-Gaza war has turned them away. I think what Biden has done in aiding and abetting a genocide is just something I cannot stand for. You're willing to withhold your vote in the presidential election unless there is a ceasefire. Yes. And it's implemented. Yes. Not voting could mean Donald Trump gets into office. Do you think he'll be better on Gaza? Trump would probably say flatten Gaza and make it into a golf course. I have absolutely no faith in him. Would you not say that also the people who are not voting for one of the two people who are the likely people to really be in this race have a role to play in kind of giving the race to Donald Trump in a state like Georgia where it's going to be like razor thin? Yeah, no, I'll I'll do you one better, actually. I think that just means that's why the Democrats should listen. Exactly. Now, I'm not buying the narrative that the major beef with Joe Biden is the handling of Israel and Hamas. I think this gets headlines from activists. But this is making an impact on why Biden is making the decisions he's making right now. The problem is, if he does that to accommodate this very small vocal minority, he's actually going to be alienating other voters. But someone's talking in his ear and convincing him that this is the biggest problem he's got. And yeah, those people aren't going to vote for Donald Trump. But if they do, in fact, stay home, that does hurt Joe Biden in a big way. Also, a lot of young voters are turning to Robert F. Kennedy. And that brings us to this other NBC News report specifically about where young voters are right now, because Joe Biden is trying to unconstitutionally give everybody free money to pay off part of their student loans. You know, those student loans that they freely and willingly agreed to pay off someday. And now they're screaming and crying and begging for the government and Grandpa Joe Biden to reach into a pocket that doesn't already have any money in it in the first place and print new money to pay off those student loan debts. Yeah. Yeah. Those student loan debts. Well, in a cynical approach of trying to get more young voters on his side, he announced this new student loan payoff scam. And it's still not helping him with young voters. Take a look at these numbers. In the 2020 NBC News exit poll, candidate Biden led former President Trump by 24 percentage points among voters under 30. But an NBC survey in January had President Biden up by just eight percentage points among that group. Another poll last month showed Mr. Trump ahead by 18 points among voters under 30. In the Wow. Now, listen, of course, those numbers are all over the place. But for the Fox News poll to actually show Trump ahead by 18 points in that 18 to 29 demographic, that's unheard of. That's astounding. 
that's a death certificate for Joe Biden. Listen, I don't know if Donald Trump is going to win with those voters, but I do know this. There is a viable option for those voters right now if they don't want to vote for Trump and they don't want to vote for Biden. And it's RFK Jr. Robert Kennedy is appealing to Gen Z. Robert Kennedy is appealing to those young voters. And and that could be enough in those states like Georgia, like Pennsylvania, like Michigan, Wisconsin, even Arizona. If enough of Biden supporters in that age group decide, yeah, I don't like Trump, but I don't like Biden either. I'll just vote for Kennedy. Kennedy's not going to win a damn state but he's certainly going to lose a state for Joe Biden. And that's where the numbers are headed right now. You saw that video of the guy in Dearborn, Michigan, who was screaming death to America, death to Israel. And I know, I know, he's just a pro-Palestinian demonstrator, right? He's he's certainly not pro-Hamas. He's certainly not pro-terrorist. He's certainly not anti-American. He's just leading chants of death to Israel and death to America. Well, those protesters were actually in Rashida Tlaib's district in Dearborn, Michigan. And Jesse Kelly yesterday analyzed what her reaction is to her voters, her constituents, her citizens screaming for the death of our country. This should be a no-brainer. This should be a slam dunk. It should be a layup at the very least if you can't get up over the rim. To be able to say, as much as I sympathize with their concern over what's going on in Gaza, this is the greatest country on earth. After all, I'm a congresswoman for this country. And the last thing we should ever approve of is someone chanting death to America. That's not hard at all. So let's see how Rashida Tlaib did. Fox News alert over the weekend, a group of pro Hamas protesters chanted death to America at a Ramadan rally in Dearborn, Michigan. Not a great look. The mayor condemned it. The White House condemned it. But what about Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib? She reps Dearborn. Is she okay with her constituents chanting death to America? Fox Business correspondent Hillary Vaughn asked her. Watch. Congresswoman Tlaib. Fox News. I don't talk to Fox News. At a rally in your district, people were chanting death to America. Do you condemn? I do not talk to Fox News. But do you condemn chants of death to America? I don't talk to people that use racist tropes. Why can't you just say whether or not you condemn people chanting Fox death to America? Why are you afraid to talk to Fox? Fox News is not, not listen, using racist tropes towards my community is what Fox News is about. And I don't talk to Fox News. It's death to America racist? Is chanting death to America racist? I'm talking about your guys' racist tropes. You know, you guys are, you guys know exactly what you do. I know you're Islamophobic, but you guys got to go deal with it on your own self. You're not going to use me. Oh, well, that clears things up. I just won't talk to Fox News because you guys are racist. Um, since you're the queen of spotting racism wherever it may rear its head, uh, do you think the guy standing in the streets of your district screaming death to Israel may have some hate issues himself, ma'am? Of course, we know that she supports that guy. She probably wrote his speech. And she, by the way, is one of the most powerful Democrats in Congress right now because she's the one who's convincing Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer, for that matter, to abandon Israel. Because all they care about, and I mean all they care about, is winning the next election. Because winning the next election keeps them in power. I honestly, I wish my political party was this craven in their quest for political power. Because let's face it, if you don't have political power in this country, you can't get anything done. And like it or not, Democrats get that better than anyone else. And yes, if it means throwing Israel under the bus, Joe Biden will do it in a heartbeat if that means winning Michigan. The problem is there's plenty of voters, not just in Michigan, but all across this country, who find this so vile and despicable. Josh Hawley represents many of those voters in the state of Missouri in the United States Senate. And I'm sure you saw that 
a video yesterday of code pink protesters trying to shut down the cafeteria in the Senate office building and protesting through the streets. They were arrested. I don't think they were thrown in jail like January 6 protesters. But uh, before they were arrested, Josh Hawley walked straight into that crowd and confronted them. Watch. Probably all of them. Yeah. Are the Uyghurs the Uyghurs? 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 the Uyghurs the Uyghurs? the Uyghurs the Uyghurs? Are the Uyghurs the Uyghurs? the the Uyghurs? Are the Uyghurs the Uyghurs? the the Uyghurs? Are the Uyghurs the Uyghurs? Are the Uyghurs the Uyghurs? the Uyghurs the Uyghurs? Are 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 the Uyghurs the U
That's who Erwin Chemerinsky is in terms of whose side he's been on in the past. And at his home, he was having a party for recent graduates of the UC Berkeley Law School because he's a dean of the law school at Berkeley now. And one of his guests brought herself a microphone and a speaker system into his house and began her own private demonstration for the cameras. Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings upon you all. Tonight, we are gathered here in the name of no, commemorating our final few weeks please as please. law students. This is my house. Tonight my is guest. also the last night of the holy month of Ramadan, where millions of Muslims around the world fast, not only we have attorneys. We have attorneys. Okay, you don't have to get aggressive. I'm not going to leave our house. You're a guest at our house. This is our First Amendment, right? No, this is our First Amendment. It is. The National Lawyers Guild has informed this is our First Amendment, right? I get. We're going to watch this play out because, boy, this is not a. If this isn't a perfect example of of the beast that you have created and fed the frankenstein monster that you encouraged erwin chimerinsky now coming back and trying to destroy you but but before we let this play out and we enjoy uh our eating our popcorn as we watch the schadenfreude take place in front of us can we just pause for a second and reflect on the terrifying reality that a graduate from the UC Berkeley School of Law believes that she has a First Amendment right to go into someone's private property in their backyard with a microphone and say whatever the hell she wants against his wishes. And she keeps saying, I have a First Amendment right. You don't have a First Amendment right to come onto somebody else's property and say whatever you want, especially when they clearly are asking you to leave. This is what you learned at Con Law 101 at UC Berkeley? Actually, probably this is what she learned in Con Law 101 at UC Berkeley because it was probably taught by Erwin Chemerinsky. Okay. I, and they are this aware of this. They're not wrong. This is my house. This is my house. You're no longer you welcome here. Police. You are not welcome. Okay, you can call the police. No, I don't You can call the police. You. I'm getting... Please stop touching her. Just please leave. If you don't want to be here, leave my house. Please leave my house if you don't want to be here. This is your my guest in my house. You are not invited for this purpose. We are talking about Ramadan and the holy month of Ramadan as Muslim students. We refuse to break our fast on the blood of Palestinian people. The UC has committed sending two billion dollars to weapons manufacturers. I know, and we're just giving a speech about Ramadan and the holy month. If you can grab me the mic back, I will leave. Good. Okay. But will you please give me the mic? Please, will you give me the mic back? Let me take. Let me turn it off. Please turn it off. I'll turn it off. House. You're not a party. guest. You're a guest in my and house. I know, but 40,000 people are dying. 40,000 Palestinian people are dying. And if you don't wish to be here, please leave my house. Law yeah. school is giving $2 million to please leave our house. I encourage everyone here It is incredibly to rude of you to abuse our hospitality in this way. Join us in walking out. There's a genocide going on. Then don't you come here. Divest, you haven't done anything about divestment. Please leave you my not house. Done anything about divestment. I don't You've not done anything about divestment because they're demanding that you see Berkeley divest from Israel. I uh, remember when a few years ago we were here telling you that the divestment BDS movement on college campuses was nothing more than trying to hurt Israel, support Hamas terrorists. And, and we were saying, oh, that's outrageous. No, they just want to get uh, college money out of it. No, 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 this is who they are. This is the divestment and the BDS movement. Also, do you notice they all have their kafias, their, their terrorist cosplay scarves. They were hidden in their purses. And then they all brought them out and put them on. When the moment arose, this was all planned and pre-programmed. They had their camera waiting. They brought their microphone. It's it's disgusting, but it's also hilarious because, again, this is the Frankenstein monster beast that Erwin Chemerinsky has single-handedly created. And, hey, it's Berkeley, man. It's Berkeley. It's not like they're Ben Shapiro or something. 
to invest in anything. Uh, I'm not going to argue with you. This is a party. In the okay. Okay. Council on the Merida Islamic Relations SF will be hearing how you pulled a Muslim woman's scarf during Ramadan. Putting your hands I on my hijab is unacceptable. Oh, you missed that part. Uh, the Council of American Islamic Relations will be hearing from you about how you pulled a Muslim woman's headscarf during the month of Ramadan. God, the entitlement of these people. I'm going to come into your home as your guest. I'm going to disrupt the party. I'm going to piss everybody off. But if you touch my headscarf, that's it. You'll hear from my people. And guess what? Again, care will support her. The ACLU will support her. If pressed, if Joe Biden thinks he's about to lose California, if this woman's from Michigan, Joe Biden's going to come out on her side. If she's from California, it doesn't matter really because, you know, there's no loss there. But, oh, boy, if she's if she was born in Dearborn, it's over. Go ahead. Sorry, Chemerinsky, you're not getting that uh, federal court nomination. <laughs> By grabbing my arm, my you home. will hear from Kara Sass. You I will hear from Pauli Gold. And them. the fact that your wife was able to assault a Muslim Palestinian hijabi student. Is she not grabbed great. her. Please, Please, leave, leave, our house. We are Please leave our house now. This we are not leaving. Your we are leaving. This We're is leaving. my home. I, I had a home in Palestine too. I'm and people sorry. took it as well. There it is. That's the American left right now. That's who they are. And that's who's been created empowered, elevated, platformed, and celebrated by Erwin Chemerinsky, the political left, the Marxists, academia, the media, the pop culture, the entertainment industry, and of course, the Democratic Party and Joe Biden. And here's the thing. They're all anti-Israel. And all those people I just mentioned, Hey, they're down for the cause. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Go ahead. Go after Israel. We don't like them either. They seem like white Europeans. They're colonialists. And, and besides, they're pretty conservative, it seems. I think they liked Trump over there in Israel. So go for it. Go ahead. But see, that beast that they've created, that monster, it's not going to stop at Israel. Every single bastion of higher learning and, and cultural elitism and power in this country are next on the target list. And the only other surprise that's going to come when this story plays out the way it seems to be playing for the political left is that woman, the woman who was giving the speech at UC Berkeley, who claims that she has a home in Palestine, wherever that is, and that she's from those territories. The only really amusing irony at the end of this whole storyline is that that woman, when she goes back to what she claims to be her homeland, she will not be allowed to practice law. That very expensive law degree she got at UC Berkeley that I'm guessing the Iranians paid for, uh, she will not be welcome to do anything in society, really, because <laughs> Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, they're not your friends either, young lady. You'll be wishing, pining for the days of good old Berkeley, California. Something tells me she won't be going back home anytime soon. Yesterday in the United States Senate, our favorite senator from Louisiana, John Kennedy, was holding a hearing. And one of the witnesses said that we need to aggressively go after corporations because they are tax cheats. Now, I know that it's a political talking point on the left that big, bad, evil corporations must be destroyed. And they think that by going after corporations, they're going after conservatives or Republicans because all those big money people, they just fund Republicans. But you see, times have changed. This isn't Bill Clinton's 1996 anymore, and it's certainly not Barack Obama's 2010. No, no, no. This is Joe Biden's 2024. And the corporations in this country, they're seen by we Republicans, we conservatives, as part of the problem because they've gone more woke than many college campuses. And they don't care about politics. They care about their bottom line. And if that means helping fund the woke politicians or woke universities or getting behind outrageous woke efforts like 
turning every corporate logo into a rainbow every June or funding abortions for people if they want to travel across state or or boycotting Georgia because they actually wanted to look at a photo ID before they accepted somebody's vote, then they're going to go ahead and do it. So when we hear that a corporation is cheating on their taxes, well, we'd like to get to the bottom of it. And so does Senator John Kennedy. So the questioning began. Ma'am, you said that corporations are cheating on their taxes. Can you please give us more information about that? And then, well, I want you to enjoy the rest. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Mellon, is your, is your expertise in the area, Mr. Bunn made this distinction, is your expertise in the area of tax avoidance or tax evasion or both? I would say both. I think the lines, uh, there, there are situations where the lines might get blurry, especially on the corporate side. Um, but in, in my... Uh, it's both. It, it's both. In okay. short, it's both. Um, do, do you believe that there are major American corporations that are cheating on their taxes? I think... I, I think, yes, there are cases where the transfer pricing regulations are not being followed. And Mr. Curtis' testimony speaks are. to that. Who are they? Who are the five? Name the five American corporations that are the biggest tax cheats. Well, this is this is this is a question for the IRS. It's their job to enforce the laws. So I wouldn't. But I, that's a pretty serious allegation you made there. And I'm I'm just asking you who they are. Uh, there are cases pending against a number of companies until they, those cases conclude. I, it, but, you know, it's who, not. Who do you think they are? You're an expert in this area. I'm just asking you. You talked a lot, and I've read some of your writings about American corporations cheating on their taxes. I'm just asking you who they are. I, I wouldn't use the word cheating. I think that they are uh, taking advantage of the of the you gray used zone. It in your testimony. I, I, I'm sorry. You used it in your testimony. I'm just, I'm, I'm not trying to trick you. I just want to know you, you have been very uh, vociferous in saying that American companies are cheating. Okay. That's, I, as America, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're an expert and just tell me who they are. I stand by that. I think that there is evidence to suggest that some of these companies and the IRS has pursued cases against a number who, of the companies who are they, that... Though? I just want to pause just to enjoy this moment with you. First, she said that these corporations are cheating. Kennedy says, name the top five companies. Just name five in general. And she doesn't. She refuses to. Then she says, yeah, I wouldn't use the word cheating. They're taking advantage of the gray area in the law. And then Kennedy reminds her, well, you actually literally used the word cheating, actually. And she says, well, I'll stand by that. Yes, they are. They're absolutely cheating. And he just says, so name them. I'm a senator. If I know, if you know that somebody's breaking the law and cheating on the tax code, tell me we'll do something about it. And it just goes on and on. And this is a great example, by the way, when you're engaged in a political debate with somebody, whether it's formally or whether it's informally, you know, at your Thanksgiving dinner table and your liberal brother-in-law shows up and wants to pick a fight with you, or, you know, the left-wing Bernie Sanders woke guy in the cubicle down the hall at your office, when they when they make these statements that are just, well, everybody knows, you know, the conventional wisdom, just challenge the premise. Don't accept and stipulate to the facts that they want to bring to the table because they always want to have the arguments on their terms. So this woman walks up and says, so everybody knows the corporations cheat on their taxes. Now, here's what we need to do about it. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. If corporations are cheating on their taxes, we should know about this. Please tell us. So let's watch how this develops that Mr. Curtis has analyzed, including Apple and Microsoft and Facebook. A is and Apple a tax cheat? I, I wouldn't say tax cheat. I think that's putting okay. it too strongly. Well, then, and I didn't use that word. Then who are they? I, 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 would, I wouldn't say tax cheats, but I think they are um, crossing the legal lines that have been set by Congress and by the IRS in the relevant regulations. I'm, I'm, and, I'm and because the IRS is outgunned, I'm they're confused. not able to enforce thought, the law. Thought, do you, do you, let, me, let me start over. Do you believe that there are major American corporations cheating on their taxes? 
I believe they are coming very close to crossing the line, and it's difficult for IRS that is out to enforce the line. Are they crossing the line or not? Well, it's up to the IRS to enforce the line. If I'm they don't have the you resources. your opinion. You're an expert. I think there's a good case to be made that, yes, they are crossing so, the line. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Who are they? That's up to the courts and the IRS to determine. I, I, you, you made this allegation, but you don't want to say who they are? How, how do, I mean, if you, you know who they are, you just don't want to tell us. I think that's 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 been uh, explained by Mr. Curtis in no, his analysis. No, I'm asking you to explain. You talk about tax cheats. I'm just asking you who they are, and you don't want to tell us. Yeah, and we're going to continue. There's another minute or so of this, and it's gold, isn't it? God bless John Kennedy. John Kennedy must be protected at all costs. He needs his own ser Secret Service detail just in case. We, I, I cannot imagine a time doing what we do without John Kennedy at these committee hearings. Understand what's going on here. So so let's go back to the beginning, because now you're running away from the word cheating, and you're saying they're not cheating, they're crossing the line, or they're coming close to the line. So let me still, we're going to reset. Do you believe that there are corporations cheating on their taxes? And eventually she said again, which she just said three and a half minutes ago, yes. And then he says again, well, who are they? Now, let's be clear here. She's there as an expert. That's the only reason that she's testifying there is as an expert. She was brought in by another senator as an expert on this issue. And in her expertise, for her to draw the conclusion that corporations are cheating on their taxes, one would think that she has at least one case example that she can point to that led her to that conclusion, right? And it goes without saying. Do you believe corporations are cheating on taxes? Yes, I do, but I'm not aware of any of them that are doing it. Makes absolutely no sense. You you can't hold both positions. If you if under oath in front of the Senate you say corporations are cheating on their taxes, then you've got to have firsthand knowledge of at least one that has done that. Otherwise, your first answer makes no sense. So now let's see how she tries to wriggle out of this. It, it's, it's again, I think it's for the IRS to enforce the line, and we need to make sure that the IRS is well, properly... Well, well, do you have a list of these tax sheets? No. Okay. Have you been to the IRS and said, here are these companies and they're cheating on their taxes and I can show you how they're doing it? No, I'm not. That's 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 not a. I've I've never uh, practiced in that area of law. I'm not a, so a tax whistleblower lawyer. All you've done is run around saying American companies are cheating on their taxes. I can't tell you who they are, and I haven't been to the IRS to show my data to the IRS. But I want you to believe me that they're cheating on their taxes. Is that your testimony today? No, Senator. No, the, it sure sounds like. It. I, no, I, I, I think that um, the case against some of these companies has been well documented in the public. Which companies? In, in the, Let me ask public. you one because I'm going to run out of time. Tell me in the last 23 seconds, I hear, here's, your, here's your chance. You believe there are major American corporations cheating on their taxes. You just, you, you just testified to that. I believe you told me yes. Tell me who they are. I think there are the companies that Mr. Curtis d discussed in his in his testimony. Tell, tell me who they it are. includes some of the big tech companies. It includes some worst? of the pharma companies who, that are. Who are the five worst? I I don't have a ranking. I have You're not, not compiled. Tell, you don't want to say. I I just I haven't looked into that. You you understand it makes it hard to believe your allegations if you won't tell us who they are. Talks cheap. You ever heard that expression? God bless John Kennedy. God bless him. By the way, real fast, uh, Zorka Millen is with the Fact Coalition. Fact. <laughs> Not a whole lot of facts going on there in that testimony. That's the financial accountability and corporate transparency. She was brought up to the podium or the witness stand there because she is the policy director where she leads on international tax policy and other transparency priorita priorities. 
Before that, she served as a senior advisor at the investigative watchdog Global Witness for 10 years, focusing on improving financial transparency and accountability. She taught at Georgetown and Yale University. In other words, her job is to go up there and make these big grant statements without any actual basis for them or any support. And people in Washington, D.C. look at her credentials and say, oh, well, she must be telling us the truth. She must know what she's talking about. And, oh, she's the policy director, so we'll listen to her about what our tax policy should be. And then she basically writes parts of the tax code. And when you're a consultant on things like that, you oftentimes get rewarded, not Ms. Millen in particular necessarily, but people like her who do what she does, they get rewarded for writing that tax policy because the very same major corporations that she's claiming cheat on their taxes right now, they pay a pretty penny to people just like Zorka Millen, not her in particular, of course, but they pay a lot of money to people like her with her credentials and with her positions to rewrite parts of the tax code to make it perfectly legal for those corporations to then cheat on their taxes. See, when is cheating not cheating? When you pay a lobbyist to change the laws to accommodate your cheating. And that's how people like Zorka Millen, not her in particular, of course, but people like her get very rich in Washington, D.C. And John Kennedy, he's seen this game before. And he called her out. That's it for today's show. We'll be back rumbling live again tomorrow, right where we belong. No, we'll, we, we won't, will we? Kevin, are we doing this tomorrow? As of now, I don't think so, but we'll, we'll put out a, something on YouTube or on Rumble if we decide. Yeah, to. we might. We might do. We're, we're hatching some ideas for some Friday specials. So look for us. Watch your. This is why you need to have the alert set up. So if we do go live tomorrow, you'll know about it. So make sure you uh, click that little bell and get all of our alerts. And if we're live tomorrow, which we might be just to piss you off, then we will be. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. I'm Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry.